So up until this point, we've been looking exclusively at linear compounds, but molecules can also form cyclic structures that we call rings. So here we can see some kinds of cycloalkanes, which end up just looking like these fun shapes. So basically all the rules are the same, but for a cyclic compound, we are going to utilize the prefix cyclo to indicate that it is cyclic, but the rest is the same. So a, a three carbon ring is a cyclopropane, for cyclobutane, cyclopentane, cyclohexane, etc., we would use uh, the same uh, prefixes indicating the number of carbons that we already know. Now let's see what happens when we're looking at cyclic compounds with substituents. So let's take a look at a simple example. Here we have a cyclohexane with a methyl substituent. Now things are a little bit different with a cyclic compound compared to a linear compound because of the symmetry. Now there's only one group here and it doesn't really matter where it is because all six carbons on the cyclohexane are identical. So this is simply methyl cyclohexane. We do not have to indicate the location of the methyl group because if it were on any other carbon, we could simply rotate it and it would be the same molecule. So this is methyl cyclohexane. That is uh, sufficiently unambiguous. However, when there are multiple substituents, we are going to have to use a numbering system that is a little bit different from a linear molecule because we no longer have a situation where it is left to right or right to left. Now there are actually 12 possible ways to number this ring because we could start on any of the six carbons and then go either counterclockwise or clockwise. However, we will choose the numbering system that gives the lowest set of locants possible for the substituents that are present. So let me show you what I mean. Basically, we, let's say arbitrarily if we began here with carbon one and then went clockwise, this would be one, two, three, and four. So we would have substituents on carbons one, three, and four. Let's say we started here and went counterclockwise. We would have a substituent on three, four, and then six, right? So you can see how there are many uh, possible sets of locants, but the one that offers the lowest set of locants is if we begin here, and go counterclockwise. Now the locants are one, two, and four. So it doesn't matter what the substituents are, uh, at least if they are alkyl or halogen, those are equal priority. So here, one, two, and four is the lowest set of locants possible. Then, by a separate algorithm, we're gonna just list them alphabetically as we always do. So, uh, four, Ethyl is going to be first. Uh, and then actually isopropyl is before methyl, right? Because iso is the only prefix that is taken into account for alphabeticity. So that's one isopropyl and then two methyl. cyclohexane. So once again, we chose one, two, four as a numbering system because that is the lowest possible set of locants for those substituents. And then we simply list them alphabetically as we normally would. So we just looked at some cyclic compounds with alkyl substituents. But what if we were looking at cycloalkenes or cycloalkynes or cyclic compounds with hydroxyl groups. These are the substituents that take priority over alkyl and halogen in terms of the numbering scheme. So let's look at how we're going to apply prioritization to the cyclic compounds. So here we have a cycloalkene and the uh, presence of the double bond means that we have to give prioritization to that functional group in terms of the numbering scheme. So when we have a double bond present in a cyclic compound, the two carbons that are participating in the double bond are going to be carbons one and two in some order. So we have two options, either carbon one and two or carbon one and two. Now we will choose one of those two directions so as to give any other substituents occurring sooner. So we are gonna have to number this one, two, three, four, because then the bromo group will occur on carbon four as opposed to one, two, three, four, five occurring on carbon five. So that is why we will number it this way. And so now we are going to list the substituent. We have four bromo, but then we can simply say 
cyclohexene, and that is sufficiently unambiguous because it is a cyclic compound, so we are talking about a cyclohexene, and we are uh, listing the location of the other substituent in relation to the double bond. So that is sufficiently unambiguous without saying where the double bond is. It is implied that the double bond is between carbons one and two because that's the convention we've used to number the ring. So let's look at uh, another compound with a hydroxyl group. As you would expect, this hydroxyl group is going to take priority over the alkyl group in terms of numbering. So that means that the carbon that bears the hydroxyl will be carbon one. Once again, we're going to choose the direction to number so as to giving the other substituent occurring sooner. In this case, it's going to be clockwise because that will give the ethyl group occurring on carbon three instead of four if we went the other way. So once again, we're going to say three ethyl and then again, it is implied that the hydroxyl occurs on carbon one. So we can simply say cyclo pentanol. 3-ethyl cyclopentanol. Thanks for watching guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials and as always feel free to email me with questions professordaveexplains at gmail.com.